welcome back to episode four of Macros Inc. Live. Do you think, at what point do you think we're going to like not want to bop to that intro music? Like at what point do you think it's just going to be <laughs> normal and it doesn't get us hyped up? Because it still gets me hyped up. Um, um, today, I was just thinking that music sounds like something I would hear in a bar in the 70s. <laughs> like that's what, that's what it reminds me of. Well, that's what I was going for, so it worked. Thanks. So, uh, but welcome back to the show, everybody. And today, we are going to be uh, we're going to be discussing uh, obesity. Uh, I'm your host, Dylan Miller, and I'm joined by uh, Brad Dieter here. Uh, each week, we bring you guys a new topic to discuss, and hopefully bring you closer to your goals, or at least educate you. We are your show for some things fitness and nutrition related, because, you know, maybe there's a dad joke or two mixed in there or some memes or some movie references. You never really know what you're going to get with us. So, um, like I said, today's going to be all about obesity and uh, we can uh, we can dive right in. Let's get started. This is, this is another one that I'm excited to talk about. I know I pretty much say that every time, but I think this, this topic is very... Um, I think it's it's another a lot of these topics are misunderstood don't get me wrong but there's a lot of there are a lot of myths around obesity and like especially in like how to, how to solve obesity and uh and things of that nature like how do you it's a it's a it's a very widespread issue like what are the solutions to that so we're going to dive into all that sort of stuff and we're going to kind of tackle questions one by one and hopefully dispel myths around it and uh you know and maybe get a, a closer idea give you guys an idea of what it would actually take uh, to solve some of these, uh, these issues that we're faced with. So Brad, I think, um, before we dive into the questions, well, actually the first question that we, that we have on this one kind of is a good place to start. And that is how do we define, um, obesity, right? So one of the questions that was asked was, um, exactly that. How do you define obesity? And, uh, with the caveat of, I, I know that we don't use BMI alone, right? That's, that's one of uh, one of the methods used, and, and it's just one of the factors. BMI certainly has its limitations. Um, but why don't we start there? Let's dive into how how we define obesity, like what criteria are we using, um, and just kind of, uh, and then we'll dive into the rest of the questions. When we think about how we define obesity, there's realistically three ways we can actually define it in terms of what I would consider relatively reliable ways to diagnose it. Um, the first is, the most common is BMI, right? And that's basically just an index of your height versus your weight, right? That's that's generally how we diagnose obesity um, at like a population level, right? We've written extensively about BMI and whether it's accurate for individuals, but like that's technically one of the main diagnostic criteria. <clears throat> Another one is body fat percentage, right? So based on what percentage of body fat you have, men versus women is how we can define obesity. Um, that's for adults. Amongst kids, we actually define obesity based on what percentile their body weight is. And so that's really the three ways that we can define and diagnose obesity. Um. Can, can obesity, like, there's obviously um, health markers that come with that. A person can be obese without showing all of the, you know, well, maybe a better way to phrase that is, can you be relatively healthy while being considered, you know, obese or being obese by medical standards? Yeah, so th this is... This is one of the more interesting aspects and questions to ask, and there's a couple ways to answer it. Um, to directly answer your question, you can carry a a BMI that is you know 30 or above. You can have a body fat percentage. You know, for men, I I'd have to go double check, but I think the criteria is 25 percent or higher, and women is 32 percent or higher. So you can carry the the diagnostic criteria for being defined as having obesity but you can have a normal metabolic panel, right? That is generally what people will say as having healthy obesity. But I don't think that fully 
like explains the story and I don't think it fully addresses some of the some of the things that we actually care about, right? Like why would you yeah. think about like I'll just ask you the question and then I can give you an answer. Why do you think um having obesity would be a problem? Like if you were to boil it down to like the most fundamental idea, what do you think that would be? The question you're asking is so uh, just to make sure I heard you correctly. Why do I think being obese would be a problem? Yeah. Various factors. I mean, it's it's it puts you at higher risk for um, a lot of different diseases, metabolic diseases, things like cardiovascular disease, issues with your musculoskeletal system. It reduces your lifespan. So various reasons. It's not good for you is what I would boil that down to. So your first statement nailed it. Right. It's related to risk. So it turns out that even if you have a normal metabolic panel, if you have a BMI over 30 or a body fat percentage over 25 or 32 percent, like if you meet the diagnostic criteria for obesity, you have elevated risk of I'll just call it bad outcomes. Right. Like all cause mort- the right. risk of yep. all cause mortality goes up. The risk of cardiovascular disease goes up like all of those things go up even if you're considered metabolically healthy now you have a lower risk than if you had obesity and you know a a bad metabolic panel but that just comes increased risk right and so when you think about it like that's that's how i think about it right is you can have a metabolically healthy panel right but if you carry if your bmi is higher you do have higher risk and what's interesting is that risk is relatively linear. Like as your BMI goes from 27 to 28 to 29 to 30 to 31 to 32 to 33 to 34, like that risk is relatively linear. It's not like a U or it's not like a, yeah. Know, a, it's just, it's, it's relatively linear. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's, and I actually heard um, one of the, you know, one, one of the things that we try to solve with, you know, at Macro Zinc and we coaching people is um, we we try to help people lose weight, right? Like 90% of our clients want to lose weight. And with that, you know, you in this industry, the question comes up of how do you solve obesity? And it's like, and we can dive into some of that, but um, every everyone knows that being obese is not a, a good thing. But in terms of solving that, and and if it's such a widespread issue, you know, why haven't we solved it yet? And it's, it's really, what's interesting to me is, um, I don't know if it was Dr. Spencer Nadolsky that it was someone like that, that said, uh, trying to solve obesity by telling people to just eat less and move more is like trying is like telling someone with chronic anxiety to just calm down. It's like, it's not, not, it's not going to work. Or it's like telling someone, you know, that goes to Alcoholics Anonymous to just drink less. It's like, it's a much more complex issue than that. Um, so anyways, now that we've defined that, um, let's get to some other questions. So the next one that we have, um, what are the main causes of obesity? So let's di- let's tackle that one. And, and that's probably a complex issue as well, but we can name a few genetics, right? Can influence how your body stores fat and how it responds to food intake. Um, you know, unhealthy diet is, is obviously a, a big part of it. Physical activity, uh, inactivity rather there's environmental factors, psychological factors. Um, I think the one thing that people don't mention often enough, and perhaps it's just, we don't think of it is socioeconomic factors play a, a big part in this too. Right. So there's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a mixed bag of things, um, that, that really can contribute to the overall obesity epidemic, uh, cultural factors and just our daily behavior. So, um, what, if you, if you could boil it down to, well, boil it down to as many things as you think are necessary, but what would you say are the main causes that we should, you know, that you need to look at when determining how this has become such a a widespread issue? So when I think about the main causes of obesity, I really try to break it down to like, what are, what are the main principles, right? We know that the actual cause is a chronic energy imbalance, right? You're consuming more energy than you're expending. The reason why some people gain weight versus others 
has to do with either side of that equation, right? For some people, it's more the energy intake. For some people, it's more the energy expenditure. So that definitely occurs across the spectrum, right? Like some people will eat the same amount of food their whole life. And there's periods of their life where they will gain weight or lose weight based on their physical activity. There's some people who are the same, have the same amount of activity most of their life, but tend to, you know, gain or lose weight based on how much they eat, right? Stress, holidays, whatever. But when we take both of those sides of the equation, I always ask myself, okay, what are the things that would drive someone to move less? And what are the things that would drive someone to eat more? And when we ask it in that question, you know, the way that I see the data is there's a lot of environmental factors and a lot of right. like, you know, when you say socioeconomic status, I would say social, cultural, and built environment, like structural things that impact our energy expenditure and our energy intake. And let's just take, you know, energy expenditure for um, the first place to start. If you were to look at what the average daily life of somebody in 1945 looked like versus today, right? Like here would be the average working adult's life. Let's say they have kids, they have a middle America, normal nine to five job in an office, right? And let's just say this person adopts a relatively healthy lifestyle. You wake up, you get your kids ready for school. Let's just say you wake up, you go to the gym, you get an hour workout in, you come home, you wake your kids up, you put them in the car, you carpool to school, right? You drop them off at school, you drive to the office, you sit in your office chair from nine to noon, you get a half hour lunch, maybe you take a walk at lunch, you get back to your office, you drive home, um, you get home at 5.30, you make dinner, you help the kids with homework, you put the kids to bed, you get an hour to yourself to go watch the uh, reruns of the X Files on Hulu. Not that I'm doing that right now or anything. Um, that sounds amazing, and, actually. And then you go to bed, right? That's most people's lives. Like that's just structurally what it looks like for most people. Right. And you think about how, like, the fact that we don't walk anywhere anymore. We commute by car. Right. Even when we go to the gym, yeah. we we take the car. Like our built environment yeah. that we most people live is relatively sedentary, Definitely. right? And so this uh, whole idea of like telling people to eat less and move more is not like super great advice. The reason it's not great advice in a lot of contexts is we're not built for it. Like how does that translate to your everyday life, right? So when we think about like the main causes yeah. of obesity, a lot of it just has to do with like the way that our species is engineered life for most of like let's just call it um like developed countries that's just the life we live it's a it's a relatively sedentary yeah. life and you can actually go look at the data of like what is the level of moderate physical or moderate sorry uh like sedentary moderate and vigorous activity amongst people at work and at leisure over the last hundred years and you can basically see our like physical activity at work during the day has gone for, like from yeah. a lot to almost none. Our yeah. level of sedentary behavior has gone from almost none to a lot. And so, the, I mean, these are the, on the orders of four, five, six, seven, eight hundred calories a day, right? So we just have these structural things that are driving us to not move around. On the flip side, our intake of calories has definitely changed over the last let's call it Absolutely. 70, 80 years, right? Um, sure. Everybody likes to point to like the 1970s, definitely a big inflection point. <clears throat> but there was changes occurring even before then. And what it really comes down to is um, we have an abundance of calorie availability, right? Um, it's easy to get. Um, there's really no constraints. Like even if you have a very low income, your ability to get access to three, four, five thousand calories a day is relatively high. Right. And there's even yeah. studies, you know, that show like 
lower socioeconomic status, you know, actually consumes more calories per day because of the food choices, et cetera. But we also just have created all of these structural things that make calories abundant. Um, you know, we have higher prevalence of processed foods. We have meal delivery services. Like there's just so much more convenience to getting calories. And so when I think about like the main causes, you know, obviously there's like, oh, we have, you know, increased the percentage of added oils and added sugars to our food. Like those are all like individual components of the larger picture of our food environment has changed dramatically. Our built environment for physical activity at a baseline level has changed dramatically. And it's all of these things just kind of coming together to that's just the environment that we live in. And so for us to, you know, try to maintain a body weight or lose body weight, we're really just having to engineer our lives against the grain of what modern society looks like. I think, I think you, you, you summarized everything that I had, I had been thinking prior to going live. And one of the, so You've been to different, I know you've been to different parts of the world. What, one place I used to travel to quite a bit um, in my younger days was, was Europe. And some of the countries that I'd been to, what I, what I noticed was they all, a lot of them walk or bike a lot of places. Like a lot of people in certain countries over there don't have cars or, or they do, but it's just more convenient for them to like walk and then go to the metro and then walk from there to wherever. They, so one of the things that I noticed is that people in certain other countries are more physically uh, active. So I think that, and when you look over here in the U S we're not that way. It's there aren't, there aren't metros in, unless you're in like a major city, right? Like there's, there's not a real reason to, everything's much more spread out here. So you end up just driving in a car to get there. So I thought that was really interesting. And then uh, the, the way that everything, that's why I said at the beginning of this question that we're not built for it. What I mean, what I mean is, if we were going to try to tackle the obesity problem, it would require like a, basically a drastic revision of life, like just the way we live and the structures that are built uh, for us. I mean, if, if you go to a restaurant, what do you what's the first thing you like? You open the menu. You can start with an appetizer. Right. Uh, and then, well, then it's on to your main course. Because the, the 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 food that you eat before your food, that's just the warm up food, right? And then then you have your main course, and then it's, hey, you guys hungry for dessert? Yeah, bring on the dessert. So like in one meal at a restaurant, you're well over. You can easily be well, sometimes double probably what you require uh, calorie wise in a day. So the 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 uh, availability of of food is uh, is higher than it's and it's it's encouraged, right? Like it's encouraged everywhere we go. We're encouraged to eat more. If you're sitting in front of the TV, you're probably snacking on something. It's it seems like everywhere we go, it is like the structures that we've created in society are built for obesity or like just to be it's to become overweight, right? So yeah, just really interesting, um, interesting point that you that you summarize. I think it would it's just that's why I say it's a very complex problem. It would require a lot of uh, just a drastic revision of the framework that we've uh, that we use for society. So I mean, um, I think to go another layer before we move on from that, I think to go another layer deeper, um, you know, first, the joke is always, hey, do you want four string cheeses? And you're like, no, would you like these dipped in breading and then deep fried and called mozzarella sticks? Yes, I'll have four of them. Um, Correct. But I think there's a layer deeper than what you're saying. And I don't think it just has to do with kind of recreating the structure of society. I think even more importantly than that is it has to, you have to change the incentives and what we prioritize, yeah. right? I would guarantee you, if you were to ask people, how do you prioritize your day? It is like either family work uh, something else and then your health right or it's work family health it's never my health is first right and then i structure yeah. everything else around it right and it's yeah, that's a good point it's sort of like here is the here's like the scenario i paint to myself right most people's journey in life is buy a box to live in or get a job, buy a box to live in, get a slightly better job, buy a bigger box to live in, get a another better job, get a, another bigger box to live in, 
And along the way, I'll try to do some hobbies that I enjoy, right? Like that's that's the narrative of most people's lives, right? Instead of, I'm going to buy a box to live in because I have to have somewhere to live. I'm going to get a better job. And then I'm going to use that better job to buy the freedom to where I can wake up every day and go, hey, you know what's the most important thing that I have? The time I have on this planet and my health. And I'm going to like, I'm going to prioritize being able to walk around all the time and go hiking and go fishing and, and live an active lifestyle and then work will be second. Right. But we have created a structure and a narrative and an incentive program, like in our own brains that basically puts it on the back burner. And I think that's a, I mean, I'm guilty of the first one, right? Like I get it. Like that's just the way we're programmed. And I think it goes even deeper to where like, we have to think about restructuring overall incentives priorities yeah and i was by the way i was only i was laughing at what you when you said the box part because there's this my uh my buddy and i have this joke that like life is a series of boxes like you live in a box then you get in a box to travel to the box where you work and then you go back to the other box so it just became this joke about life as a series of of boxes and i just that struck me as funny so when i heard you say that i was like oh you'd you'd fit right in with uh with us um great points though uh excellent points um Next question we have here, is obesity influenced uh, more by genetics or lifestyle? And this one, I love this question because it's like, it's, it's, there's a combination of both. And I, I, I've had these talks with you before, and I really liked the way that you summarized it. It's kind of like the way you, the way you described it was, you know, you're, you're born with you're born with a certain genetic predisposition for like developing certain conditions and then how you live your life. You can turn that dial one way or the other. Like, like in other words, you can increase or decrease that risk, right? So genetics, again, they predispose you to, let's say we're talking about obesity because that can affect how you store fat, um, appetite regulation, how you metabolize food, right? And then lifestyle factors like your diet, physical activity, uh, stress, sleep, you know, those have an influence on your chances of becoming obese. And then of course, you know, the field of epigenetics, you know, it's very well established that lifestyle factors can also influence gene expression and how genes related to obesity are expressed, right? So like a poor diet, um, or sedentary lifestyle can trigger genetic factors that make it easier to gain weight, right? But eating better and moving more can sort of suppress those genes. So I, I love that question, but let's dive into that a little bit more and, and talk about, you know, is it more influenced by one or the other and sort of the relationship there? Yeah. So I think there's a few places to go with this answer. And I think I'll start with just a really fundamental understanding of how how we think about genetics and obesity and like the modern environment. <clears throat> and this is probably one of the areas where I would say I probably disagree with the um, kind of consensus in the scientific literature. And I'll kind of go into a little bit as of why. Okay. So genetics and obesity can be basically um, divided into two categories. There's what we call monogenic obesity, which is one gene, one disease. And there's polygenic, which is multiple genes interacting to influence disease risk, right? So monogenic obesity is things like a leptin deficiency, right? Where if you're born with this condition, like if you are missing this, this gene, you are going to become obese no matter what, with, unless you have massive medical intervention, right? Like those are very well defined. There's a couple of those. Like there's, uh, there's leptin deficiency, there's Prader-Willi syndrome. Like there's some of these things where they basically the internal mechanisms that regulate body adiposity and calorie intake and calorie balance are like just completely missing. And you have like no ability to control appetite, et cetera, right? We know that happens, but that's very, those are very rare cases. Polygenic obesity is where, like you mentioned, is we have this genetic profile that we have all these tiny little dials, right? And there's some people who have a bunch of dials that are all lined up to like, hey, maybe you're slightly more prone to eat more calories. Maybe you're slightly mm -hmm. more prone to really enjoy high salt foods or high energy foods. Hey, maybe you're just 
wired to consume a little bit or expend a little bit less energy. And hey, maybe you're actually wired that when you overconsume calories, you burn off the excess much less efficiently than other people. So you tend to store more of your excess calories as body fat, right? That's polygenic obesity. That's what we talk about for most people when we talk about the genetics of obesity, right? And there's some really interesting literature um, when we look at twins, right? And I'm not going to quote any of the specific studies, but basically here's what we see when we look at twins. There is, if you take twins and you overfeed them, there is a higher concordance of weight gain between the two twins than between different sets of twins, right? So what that tells us is there does appear to be these polygenic traits, right? Where some people are more prone to store or become obese than other people, right? So that is very true. Like we can we can see this in these twin studies. Conversely, there's twin studies where we take them and we give them, we just, we don't give them, but like we can track twins who've been separated at birth and live very different lives. And the phenotype of them is very different, right? Some of them are very unfit, very obese, and some of them are very fit and very lean, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know that even with genetic predisposition, environment and lifestyle choice definitely drives your phenotype, right? Like, it's not like if you have a high polygenic score, you're 100% going to become obese. It's like, you may be more prone to it, but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And so where I think I maybe disagree slightly with the consensus in the literature is there appears, the consensus is roughly 30 to 50, in some cases as high as 60 to 80% of obesity is explained by genetics. There are some review papers that suggest it's that high. Well, I don't, I would not have guessed that. That's interesting. Yes. And the reason that I don't think that that's accurate is it's, it's incredibly hard to tease out like genetic heritability and learn behavior heritability from the environment you live in, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the twin studies of discordance between lifestyle and phenotype outcome, that tells us that there is a very powerful environmental factor, right? Right. But when you look like across families and even generations, you will see obesity generally tends to follow like family paths, right? Like it's very rare that you see, you know, a family of let's, let's say like two, three generations where it's like everybody's lean and then, you know, the next generation, everybody's obese, right? It's very rare that that happens. And it's generally what happens is lifestyle behaviors, those things are heritable in the fact that they're learned behaviors, right? Like we also see this like in the nutrition literature. It's it's the same thing of like I always say um health patterns cluster, right? Like when you go look at these studies and they're like people who drink the highest amount of diet coke, you know, carry the highest BMI, right? It's like, well, if you actually look, like the people who consume a 12 pack of diet coke a day also consume 500 calories more a day. They're more likely to smoke, they're more likely to drink, you know, alcohol. They're they're less physically active. So it's like behaviors tend to cluster and those clusters generally occur in like family arcs. And so I think a lot of the reports of like genetic susceptibility have to do more with behavioral heritability than genetic heritability. That's like at least my interpretation of the literature as it currently stands. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, uh, in order to, so let's, to wrap this question up, um, what is there a percentage you would put, you would put on that, you know, so genetics lifestyle, or is it, is it really something you can't really put a percentage on? Like you can't say half and half or 40, 60. Um, do you have you know, an opinion on that? One, I don't know if I have enough data to make a really good guess Two, okay. Okay. I don't, I don't think it really matters as much as people would say. And here's why I yeah. say that. that 
I don't want to give somebody, I don't want to say, Hey, be, based on your genetic score, you're 40% more likely to become, yeah, you've got, like, what is, what right. is that? Like, no what does hope. that mean to you? Is that going to change? Right. Is it going to change your right. like approach to the problem? Like right. probably not. Right. And is it really useful or helpful information? Now, mm -hmm. In some cases, it may be helpful if you're like, man, like I feel like I've been really diligent working on this and I'm losing weight slower than somebody else. Like, yes, that that information might be give you some peace of mind of like, oh, yeah, my body's just less efficient at, at X, Y and Z. Right. I mean, it's sort of like let's say your goal is to make it to the NBA. Right. And when you were born, I gave you a genetic profile that was like, hey, you're going to be six one with a 26 inch vertical and you're going to be mildly athletic, right? Versus, Hey, you're born six, eight, two seventy. You're going to be six, eight, two seventy five with a 45 inch vertical. And you're going to be the most athletic person ever born. Like you're still going to have to do a ton of work to get to your goal, right? You just may have to put in a little bit more work than somebody else, but it's not like you're not going to still do the same things to get there. You're just going to probably have to do more of it. Sure. Some people have to do some, in other words, some people have to work harder at something. Some have to work less hard at, at, at whatever it might be. And that's really the difference there. Yep. Yep. That's a good point. Um, <clears throat> so what are some, our next question here is what are some common myths about obesity that need to be debunked? Um, and this one, you know, this one was interesting because there are a lot of myths about it. And I think the overall, like the big one is what we were talking about earlier. And that is obesity is caused by overeating and a lack of exercise and thus can be solved by eating less and exercising more. And while like in theory, if everyone did that, yeah, you'd lose weight, but this is the real world, right? Like we are human beings with deeply ingrained behaviors with environmental influences. And so saying, it's like I said earlier, saying to, you know, telling someone to lose weight by eating less and moving more is sort of like telling someone with anxiety to just, Hey, you just need to calm down. It's like, okay, wow. Why didn't I think of that? You know, it's a lot harder uh, to, to actually do those things uh, than it sounds. And so I think the reality is you know, that myth that obesity is caused just by overeating and a lack of exercise and can be solved that way, you know, diet and exercise are absolutely important factors, but obesity is a very, it's a complex condition influenced by a variety of things. We've already talked about several of them, genetics, environment, psychological factors, there are biological mechanisms at play. So it's not really just as simple as calories in, calories out. Um, that that's my that's the big myth for me. Are are there any myths uh, that you're aware of that you think need to be debunked and that you'd like to to address? Yeah. So I think the the two biggest myths, and maybe these are not myths, but stereotypes that I think we mm -hmm. should discuss is yeah. There's sometimes this narrative of like, hey, people who are people who have obesity are just lazy or lack willpower. Um, and I just, yeah. one, it's just not true. And two, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly naive, right? Um, yeah. You know, it one, the reason the process really, yeah. I mean, the research has shown like as much as I don't love psychology research, um, just because of the qualitative nature of it and just how difficult it is to replicate, um, there's been so much work done in that area where it's like, it's very clear that people with obesity, it's not as simple as a willpower issue. Right. And, and even in some studies, those people sure. generally score higher on like a willpower scale than people who have never been, you know, never had obesity or things like that. So that's a myth that just like needs to die. Right. Um, and the other one is like, they're lazy. It's like, that's really not the case either. Like what it, what generally happens is there are behavior patterns that need to be shifted and changed. There's like structural life things that need to be adjusted and changed. There's modifications to like just daily choices that need to change, you know, built environment things that need to change, et cetera. Right. So it's, I think putting those two labels on that is just like one, not accurate 
two, horribly naive, and three, just very, very unhelpful, right? I mean, I've I've had clients sure. like here's a good example. In my coaching career, I've had clients who've been like hyper successful people. Like they work a bazillion hours a day. They like can just put their head down and focus for weeks, months at a time. Like they're definitely not lazy and they definitely have a lot of willpower, right? And they struggled with weight loss. And then as soon as they moved to a different city, within like three to four months, they'd lost like 40, 50 pounds without changing anything else about their life. Right. So the built environment, that's like, really interesting. That's there's really so interesting. many things that go into it and like just kind of pinning it down on things like that. I just think is just really not a useful thing. And anyway, I, I think in, in the environment, man, is so interesting to me because we really are a product of our environment. And I think it's wild just how much our, our environment influences the way we are. Um, and I mean, that goes for every organism ever, right? Like not just humans. I mean, that's like a, that's like the nature of, of reality is you're, you are, you know, you adapt to the environment around you. It's, it's, it's influential. So that, that's really interesting to me that people, you know, move to a different city and, and, uh, and, and that changes things for them. Well, I mean, um, even think about it, that, like you, with the amount of people you've coached, I mean, how many clients have you had that have gone on a vacation to Europe, right? And they end up like the narrative we hear from a lot of clients is like, oh my God, I ate so much pasta. I ate so much pizza, pizza, right. pizza. I ate so much gelato. I ate over ate so much food, but I actually came back like two pounds lighter because they sure. walked everywhere, yep. right? It's like yep. these environmental aspects of our lives, I think are so heavily underrated. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, in the times that in my travels, again, my younger days when I was just, you know, backpacking through Europe, I do remember one specific time where I didn't, I mean, I ate like a lot over there because I met other friends and we'd go out to eat and we'd have drinks and I was a young kid and I was partying and all that. So my, my calorie intake definitely didn't change, but there was one time I came back and I want to say I was, I don't know, I'd lost like seven or eight pounds. Like I was leaner in my stomach. I was like, holy crap, I didn't change anything other than I just, I was so much more active over there. So that is a really good point that, uh, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's overlooked and just your environment can have a huge influence where I don't think we're, we're always cognizant of that. So very, um, very good point. But yeah, we, we, we do see that a lot. Um, that's also final thought here. That's also why for anybody watching or anybody that's like got a vacation coming up, we're almost, we're at the tail end of summer here. So I get that, but we've had a lot of clients that have, that are going on vacation or coming back from one. I just want to point out your environment, you while you're on vacation, it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily gain weight. In fact, uh, I think if you stay relatively active and you walk and you sightsee, and if you're on a beach, you walk up and down the beach and you, you can, if you stay relatively active, you're going to minimize that, uh, that weight gain. Just a, just a point I wanted to, uh, to mention, cause I think there's this misconception that oh, I'm going to gain so much weight. doesn't have to be true. Um, so just a quick point there. Um, this next question here, uh, this is by our marketing manager, uh, Jem. She asked a really good question. And the question is what's the correlation slash slash causation between UPFs and obesity. So for anyone that's uh, that doesn't understand, it's uh, UPF is uh, short for ultra processed foods. And typically we think, you know, like, so think of like, I don't know, any, you go walk into a store and you think of your packaged food. So potato chips or just junk food, right? And those are typically higher in calories, right? So they, they contain more added sugars. They have um, typically higher levels of fat higher levels of refined carbohydrates. So consuming those high calorie foods, um, it's easy to overconsume them. And the other part of that, uh, that is another reason why it's so easy to overconsume them is low satiety, right? Like they're lower in fiber. Typically they're very low in protein usually. And those are a couple of things that promote satiety, the feeling of, you know, feeling full. And so when you eat high calorie foods, uh, and that are not very filling, it's easier to eat large, uh, quantities. That's just a kind of a surface level answer. I think there's perhaps more to that, but, um, the correlation, Brad, uh, between UPFs and obesity, wh where do you see that, uh, that correlation? Well, I think it's pretty strong, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's no denying that people who tend to consume diets, higher in processed food, specifically ultra processed food generally tend to consume more calories and generally tend to carry a higher BMI, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to add to what you 
had to say is there's a few caveats to it. And one is there's this idea that like ultra processed foods are inherently more fattening because of like some, like their, their digested easier, they're processed easier. And it turns out like, that's just not quite the case. Right. Um, they are digested easier. And I'll tell you a funny story about that in a second. But that has, and the calories are technically more readily available, but that's not really why they end up driving um, or being highly correlated with carrying a higher BMI. It primarily has to do with what you had indicated, right? Is they're generally higher in energy density, right? And we know that diets that have higher energy density, which is calories per gram of food, people tend to consume more calories. Um, they have higher palatability. So ultra processed foods are usually like higher salt, higher fat, higher sugar, um, better mouthfeel. Like, um, you know, they have all of the like engineered factors to make them more enjoyable. So we tend to, over -cons we tend to consume more. In fact, like if you were to take and you put foods on a scale of like very low in palatability, which is just like how much you enjoy the food to very high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. foods with high palatability you consume about 40 to 60 percent more calories in a given meal right oh, so, i totally so believe it, that yeah. yeah so it drives you to consume more in a given meal and then to your other point is these foods are generally lower in water lower in fiber lower in protein so they have less satiety which means you're going to be hungrier faster after that meal. So you're going to eat more frequently. So all of those things conspire to just have you consume more calories in a day than you would otherwise. In fact, we've tested this, right? We've put people in metabolic wards. We've given them like identical diets, like macronutrient wise. And one was highly processed. One was not processed. And the people who consume processed foods consumed like a thousand calories a day more even though they weren't told to. It's just like you just have a higher desire to yeah, eat those foods. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's such a that's that is the other factor, right? Palatability and reward response, let's call it, right? Those are those types of foods are they're designed to be palatable. They are designed to taste very good and trigger the reward centers of the brain, right? So, and that definitely leads to uh, increased cravings of that particular thing. And you overeat. I mean, yeah, the high, I think the hyper palatability is a big one. So, um, so, so the, but the, yeah, the, so the correlation there is pretty strong. Um, I also think that, that sort of ties into what, what we were talking about earlier with the restaurant thing, right? Like if you look at restaurants, we love going out to restaurants because the food that they serve, generally, if it's a good restaurant, it's pretty damn tasty, and it's easy to overeat those things. And that's why it goes back to the to the other point that we were talking about is just the way society is structured. You did a really good job touching on that point. Is just that like we are encouraged to overeat. Seems like everywhere you look, and UPFs are a big a big part of that. Um, not just UPFs, but yeah, like I said, just the way even the way meals are prepared. You could have, I mean, you know this. You could have a you could have a, um, a a meal consisting of whole foods and like add things to it that are that make it taste like way better. Like, okay, a steak is really good in and of itself. Throw some garlic butter on that steak. Oh man, it tastes even like tastes even better, right? So like, there's things that you can do to to even to not necessarily just ultra processed foods, but whole foods in general. That, I mean, what other like we deep fry vegetables basically. <laughs> we take like green beans and, and pickles and we de we deep fry them and make it. 10 times as calorie dense. So just, just an, our food preparation goes a long way toward that. Yeah. Too. I mean, I think it's even like, you can even go simpler than that, right? Like how much white rice, plain white rice would you yeah. eat versus if you put just teriyaki sauce on it or soy sauce on it, right? You're going to you know, consume yeah. way Absolutely. more, which also yep. I just caught myself saying the word, right? We got one YouTube comment on our last video and they basically just roasted me for saying the word right too often. So I'm calling that person. Out. <laughs> uh, you should have, you should have replied and been like, I know, right? Uh, oh, that's I what know. I would have done. Um, okay. So, uh, next question here, we got, um, 
love this question, man. I love all these questions. So I should probably just stop saying that. But uh, how does it, how does obesity affect overall health and lifespan? Probably a very um, probably a question we could do an entire like topic on, right? Like a whole live about it. But um, you know, are there any areas that you would want to touch? And I think the big ones for me, and you can tell me if you know how you know if you agree or how much those are how much we're at risk for those. But obesity affecting health. And your lifespan really comes down to, I mean, probably the number one thing is cardiovascular disease, right? Diabetes, there's probably only a few people in the world who are, you know, as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable than you on diabetes. I think you you know, a, 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 that was your, was your specialty, right? So type two diabetes. Um, I think the other things that we don't consider are um, respiratory problems, right? Like being obese can lead to respiratory issues, sleep apnea. Um, you can you can develop asthma because of it. Uh, cancer, I think, is another one. Musculoskeletal problems. Um, I think also that the more obese you become, you you see increased inflammation and immune dysfunction, and then overall mortality. So there's a there's a whole slew of things that um, that really you know uh, affect our overall health and 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 lifespan. But maybe touch on um, you know lifespan and uh, and and how these diseases. Um, you know, affect us and by how much, I think I'd be curious to hear, like, okay, are we talking it, you know, being obese can take 10 years off your life. Is it 20 years? Um, so what do you, what are your thoughts on that? How obesity affects overall health and lifespan? The data on that varies study to study based primarily on when it was done. Um, right. So if a study was done in 2000 versus 2010 versus 2020 and the population, yeah. And the level of obesity, like, you know, BMI of 25 compared to 30, compared to 40, compared to 50, et cetera. But I think probably the, the like rule of thumb that you can use is having a BMI over 30 probably reduces your overall lifespan of by about 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Like that's roughly what the number is, right? Compared to like a BMI of 25. Like that's roughly what it is. And there's a lot of studies that are like for every five units of increase, you increase your overall mortality by X. And for every like one unit increase, you increase it by like 10%, et cetera. So every study is going to give you a slightly different number, but that's probably a rough like rule of thumb, right? Carrying a BMI or a body fat percentage that has you classified as having obesity generally tends to um, decrease your lifespan by about 10 to 15 years. Now, here's the other corollary to that. And this is what I would rather focus on because I think everybody knows if you carry high BMI, health outcomes are worse. To me, what I think the most important perspective is when you reduce your BMI, you add years back to your life, right? And I think people just, if you can have that perspective, if you're like, if you're 35, 40, 45, 50 years old and your BMI or you're carrying a little bit extra body weight, even like a 5% to 10% reduction in body weight, which everybody can achieve, right? You can go from 200 pounds to a 280 pounds or 250 pounds to 225 pounds. You basically add five to 10 years back to your life. So that means... Six to 12 months of like very focused work gives you an extra decade on your life. Seems like a pretty good return. I mean, that I don't know of a better ROI. Like, yeah. I like here's the financial corollary, right? If I were to offer you $10 million today, but it's your last day alive, would you say yes? I would not. Right. It's so, okay. So now if you can get. 10 years back, which what is that? 3,650 days, something like that. Is that how the math works? Yeah. Multiply that times 10 million. That's how much that should be worth to you. So it's t six to 12 months of like making good food choices and walking more and going to the gym. Is that worth, I don't know what the math is on that, $36 billion or something or 360 billion. I don't know what the math is, but like, seems like that's, that would be. that's realistically like the financial math equation yeah. that I think about in my head. Um, and so I think that's the perspective to have is there's obviously all the negative things, right? Like that's one perspective. My perspective is always like, 
is this worth adding 10 years onto your life? From where you currently are today, like if you're struggling with this, just think about that perspective because that really is what you're doing is you're just basically adding days on your calendar. Every day you go to the gym, you add a day on your calendar. Every day you make good food choices, you're adding a day on the calendar. It's like, those are the things that should give you some good perspective. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. So for the for people who are who are overweight or you're feeling like there's no hope, right? Or I'm obese, so I've already, you know, my life's going to be already 20 years shorter. What's the point? Brad's overall point is don't think of it like that because you start making changes, you can add those years back on. So it's not it's not like it's not like you're obese in the 20 and you've knocked 20 years off your life and that's it. That's your death sentence. Like you can undo that. So yeah. Um looking at the glass uh at half full. I, I like that. Um this this next one here. Let's talk about the relationship between obesity and metabolic diseases, specifically diabetes, right? We know that that um type two diabetes, you're you're at a greater risk for developing that. I'm not the expert on diabetes. You are, but obviously obesity, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I mean, well, obesity is the leading cause of type two diabetes, excess fat, particularly in the uh, abdominal area uh, leads to insulin resistance. We know that the body cells don't respond to insulin the, the as well. The, the, the bigger you get, um, you have higher blood sugar levels, um, and then, of course, diabetes itself can cause a range of complications. So things like vision problems, nerve damage, kidney disease. So if you want to talk about, let's 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 briefly talk about um, that relationship, type two diabetes and and obesity, and how that increases your risk of of developing that. Yeah. So we did a deep dive on this in the episode. I think it was maybe the first one, the all about insulin one. So I would yeah. definitely refer yeah. people yeah. go check that one out because we have a whole episode on it. Uh, this is also a shameless plug. Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, but you. I think the way to describe the relationship between obesity and metabolic diseases is, is as you become, as you, as obesity increases, right? So you go from very lean to very obese. At every stage, what's happening is your body is trying to find places to store extra energy, right? You can store energy in your adipose tissue, so your body fat. You can store it in your muscle mm -hmm. tissue. You can store it in your liver tissue. And you can store it in kind of the internal compartments of your body, right? So kind of your visceral organs. So your body's just going to basically find places to shove energy. As your storage goes up, so as your body fat goes up, as your ability, as your body's trying to store extra energy, it's going to start storing it in places that it doesn't really want to store it because it's just looking for places to dump the extra calories. And what happens is that ectopic fat storage, because we store calories as body fat, um, starts to kind of like, gunk up the metabolic engine right so all of the all of the like intracellular energy processes all the communication between organs starts to like get less functional you basically just like start adding a bunch of entropy to the system and so all of these finely tuned metabolic processes start getting basically just like junked up That's right that. it would be like uh you know just like overloading a signal right it's like if you are trying to do you remember the old rabbit ears on tvs that like collected signal oh, yeah. mm -hmm. now what happens mm -hmm. if you would like put too much electricity into that like the signal would get fuzzy right or it would get distorted and so it's the same thing of what you're doing to your metabolism so you start to get all of these finely tuned metabolic systems like start malfunctioning and so that then contributes to disease like if you think about it insulin resistance is a disease of energy overload and disordered signaling, right? Cardiovascular disease is a disease mm -hmm. of basically accumulated metabolic dysfunction and entropy, right? You get atherosclerosis because you have like hypertension. So you get changes in blood flow, you get excess nutrients building up in your arterial walls, you get inflammatory processes that cause that to turn to scar tissue. Like 
These are all just like the accumulation of right. basically just like Things. metabolic disturbances that all arise from right. having too much energy. Yeah. Now it's more complicated than that, but like that's the basic idea. Yep. No, I think you summarized it. I think you summarized it well in a, in a way people can understand. Uh, do we have time for it. We I think we have time for, uh, for one more. Um, so let's use these last couple um this is this is something someone asked, uh, which I thought was a good question. Uh, how do we? How does obesity impact fertility and reproductive health? We know that, um, and obviously it's going to affect men differently than it affects women. Um, I, I I don't know anything about this particular topic, so uh, if if you want to shed some light on that, I, I I have to assume that obesity does have an impact on these things, but I don't really know how. So let's 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 touch on that one as our last question here. This is an area that I am definitely not an expert in, and I know just enough to be dangerous. So I'm going to try to keep to what I know to be true. That's that's why I added it. I thought you might know something. Yeah. So we know that as BMI goes up, well, there's kind of a little bit of a U curve, especially in women, right? So if you're too lean as a woman and sometimes as a man, reproductive health goes down like your ability to conceive a child your ability to have like normal sex hormones if your body fat's too low is not great right as your bmi gets past normal into overweight obesity obesity class one obesity class two etc it also starts to decrease so there's kind of like this sweet spot of your body needs to have enough energy but not too much and so we know that as obesity climbs or as your body fat increases your reproductive health goes down it primarily has to do with how hormones you know change right we also know like in men um with obesity testosterone is usually lower estrogen is usually higher um with women yeah. you get just kind of hormonal dysregulation at both ends of the spectrum of too lean or, or carrying too much uh, adipose tissue so it definitely causes a decrease in overall reproductive health. Yeah. So that's, well, I have some other thoughts on that, but might, might not have enough time. I think that's a, uh, that's an interesting one. You can, it makes me want to, you know, research a little bit more into that. Cause I think that's, it's just, it's overall interesting just how much, um, our body weight affects, so many things. Um, and I think a lot of things that you maybe don't even think about. So, um, yeah, this, these were, these were great questions and I, and I, I loved all the answers and everything that we talked about. People asked some really good questions this one. And I think we, we snuck them all in just in time. So, um, any final thoughts before we wrap things up, Dr. Brad, anything else you want to add on any of the topics we chatted about? Hmm. I, I have one thing I want to add. Go for it. If you don't. I just want to reiterate Brad's point that if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. Because <laughs> then you can. And if any of you are watching right now and you, you you caught the tail end of it or just a portion of this, it'll be up on our YouTube channel later so you can rewatch it. So, Yes, Dylan yeah. and I have a bet of how long it's going to take us to get to 100,000 subscribers. And we all know how... Uh, much I like winning, so I have to win this bet. Uh, for your Go sake, ahead. I hope I hope you do win the bet because I like uh, I like your I like your goal. So let's just hope that you do win that one. We just um, got to so, get twenty percent of all the people in the Facebook group. That's that. that that's not factually cool. inaccurate, actually. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think that's it for this week's episode, guys. We got through all the questions. So I just want to say a huge thank you for everyone to uh, everyone who's who has tuned into the show or has seen our uh, previous episodes. Um, and like I said, you can catch us on YouTube if you uh, didn't catch the whole thing. Uh, but we appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, make sure you guys tune in next week for uh, next episode. We always do these at 2 p.m. Central Time uh, every Tuesday. And uh, keep your eyes peeled in the Facebook group on Monday for the next topic reveal. That's where we'll uh, ask you to drop your questions that you'd like us to answer on the show. So I think that's all I got. Thank you all so much. Uh, until next time, we will, uh, we will see you guys very, very soon. All right. I'm out of here. Peace out. <laughs>